Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonard Waverman, the Dean of the DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. This is the latest Mac Talks, a series of virtual conversations with McMaster alumni, researchers, and award winners who are at the forefront of tackling some of the world's most pressing challenges. The first week of October is always Nobel Week, when the world's most prestigious prizes are awarded to researchers whose achievements have conferred the greatest benefits to people around the globe. For this MAC Talks, we're honored and delighted to welcome two McMaster alumni who are Nobel Prize laureates. Myron Scholes, econ grad of 1962, he must have been 15 years old, I think, a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1997, and Donna Strickland, engineering grad, 1981, even younger, a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018. Our moderator for the conversation is author and journalist, John Stackhouse with a new book out, who is senior vice president in the office of the CEO at RBC. Now let's join the conversation with Myron, Donna and John as they discuss why the Nobel Prize matters. So good evening, everyone. And uh, Len, thank you so much. It's great to see you even from, uh, from a distance. Um, this is going to be a great conversation. We'll talk about the value of the Nobel Prize, how it's changing in this uh, day and age, what we can learn from uh, the, 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 the crop this year that we've seen so far, and most critically, how it uh, transforms the lives of uh, scientists, researchers, and academics, um, uh, especially here in Canada. Donna, if I can start with you and uh, then turn to Myron to get some reflections. We're only halfway through Nobel Week, as Len described it. Uh, but what's what's jumped out at you? What what have you found most surprising, Donna, or interesting so far this week? Well, I think I'd go with the obvious: the fact that it's the number of women uh, is different, right? Uh, I did send a congratulatory email to Andrea, saying, you know, I've started a new club. This is the first time in history there is more than one female uh, physics uh, Nobel laureate. It's never before happened, right? I was the third person, but because it was always 50 some years between them, they were always dead. Uh, so I'm the first female laureate that gets to see another uh, physics laureate. Okay. One. So we've started our club, club of two. Um, and then right after that, of course, now there's two uh, women in uh, chemistry. So that's number six and seven for chemistry. So uh, I think that's got to be what stands out this year. Okay, and if I could just quickly stay with you, is this? Uh, do you think this is uh, a, a new norm? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think I was the you know sort of the dam breaking that it couldn't go another fifty some years, right? I mean that would just be ridiculous. So uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to see it more and more. And right. then Myron, that, what? you know another few years we can just quit talking about it. Right. Uh, hopefully it's only a few years. My Myron, what's, uh, what's uh, stood out to you? Well, uh, the same as uh, Donna. The, uh, it's nice to see a composition of the prizes being uh, more eclectic and not concentrated only in older men. But one of the interesting things that uh, I've always noted in the Nobel Prize awards that they're very conservative in who they award to. So as a result, they want a lot of time to pass before they give the award. So most work is done not last year or the year before. Most work is done years before and has had a big effect. And the Nobel Prize Committee is conservative and wants to make sure that they don't uh, end up in a situation where they awarded someone and the work is overturned. That's in the Stockholm Awards. I'm not so sure in the Peace Awards in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Norway that that's true. They seem not to worry about uh, whether, they're, whether it's meaningful in terms of history. But so basically, as the number of women have entered the profession in the years past, now they've accumulated a degree of equality, but that needed a, a hiatus or a time frame until that was recognized because of the lag between the time in which work is done and the award is confirmed or not disconfirmed and therefore awarded. So, uh, you know, it's still early in the uh, award season um, and we have 
uh, physiology to come, literature to come, economics to come, and also the Peace Prize to come. Um, and it, it, it might be a stretch to say there's true diversity in the, uh, the recipients, um, but I, I wonder if you find, Myron, that the reflection of the committees or of uh, the, the research community? I must be the research community. And also, I, I presume that, um, that um, you know, diversity is something that the committee is interested in. But, you know, they, as I said earlier, just the they, uh, uh, group that can be selected from is uh, now richer, much richer than it was a number of years ago. So uh, it's now the case that uh, many more uh, other than men are entering that profession and contributing uh, in, to the professions. And that's very important. Let's turn to uh, your own experiences, and I should say to the audience, we're opening it up to questions at about 25 minutes after the hour, so I'll just get uh, get this as a, a bit of a start to the conversation, but want to hear questions from the audience. Donna, tell us, uh, if you will, about the call. Uh, it's always a great, uh, great moment. What was the call like for you? Right, so on Eastern time, it, is, it comes in at five in the morning. Um, we still have a landline. We're one of the last people holding out. Uh, and the phone did ring, you know, and get us out of bed. It's a scary thing, you know? I mean, no one's expecting 35 years after the event that it's going to give you a Nobel Prize that year. So, and we have grown children, so you think it's a problem. Um, but with us, it was a little bit different. Uh, my husband handed me the phone saying they're asking for Professor Strickland. And I pick up the phone and, and they say, please stay on the line. It's an important call from Sweden. So at that point, I'm grabbing my husband going, oh my God, it's October 2nd and it's a call from Sweden. Ah! Um, and, but then they didn't come on the line. I waited 15 minutes. I've said this, I am a rule follower and they asked me to stay on the line. So I did. Now, you know, my iPad was beside the bed, so I could have like checked something, but I got off the phone and went, what do I do? What do I do? And so then I checked my email and sure enough, it said, we are desperately trying to call you. Please call us. So I had to call Sweden to uh, be told that I had uh, won the award. But anyway, still pretty exciting. That's a great, uh, great story. Myron, what was, the, uh, what was the call like for you? Well, it's interesting that I was giving a talk to a, a, an academic group that was meeting in Carmel and uh, they have generally a bird dog. It's a person who's supposed to track you and know where you are so they can find you. I, I don't know whether they knew that Donna was in bed, but they didn't know, they couldn't find me. So they didn't know where I was. And they're frantically searching for me. So they withheld, withheld, withheld the timing of the announcement. And finally, they were able to discover that I was in Carmel and they phoned the hotel where I was staying and uh, got a hold of me. And uh, I think they had actually had to make the announcement before they physically got a hold of me. And obviously they said that that was the case. And, uh, you know, when you receive the call, it's, uh, it's uh, a shock, obviously, because there's so many colleagues in the profession who could be awarded the Nobel Prize, and you know that from others that you the expectation is there, but the realization is a real shock and a, and a tremendous uh, feeling that one is awarded the prize because you know immediately there's many uh, in the profession who as well could receive the prize. If I can uh, stay with you, Myron, give us a sense of how it changed your work and your career. Well, basically, the interesting thing that it um, when you're awarded the prize, you have a different uh, audience, a broader audience. So that basically uh, among my colleagues, it's always that I had the respect that I had through my research and what I had worked on. So that was not new to them, they, you know, but to a lot of uh, the lay profession and others that you have a, a greater sense of, uh, of demand and what for me it was very hard to resist being a an expert in myriad things when I was really an idiot savant in what I discovered and created so I to, to be awarded the prize and have a unique uh, 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 advantage or unique um, uh, perspective you have to really concentrate deeply on what you're working on and many of Nobel Prize winners are asked questions about the philosophy of life and what the government should do and and what they should do in various other parts of the world and uh, 
and the like, and many uh, branch out and are willing to make those uh, statements. I try to resist that and uh, try to stay closer to what I knew as opposed to what I can pontificate about, which having very little knowledge and uh, about. So, you know, that changed the life dramatically. And one, one other quick thing is that uh, British Broadcasting Corporation in, uh, or in uh, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation asked me to go on a TV show that they were holding when I was in Toronto giving a talk at the Field Institute. And they asked me to go mm -hmm. on with Shania Twain, who was born in Timmins, Ontario, or moved to Timmins, Ontario, where I was born. And I said, no, because uh, my singing as, is as good as Shania Twain's economics. So I resisted that. <laughs> Donna, how did, uh, how did the prize change the trajectory of your, your, your work and your career? Well, I mean, it does turn it upside down. Uh, I mean, it just, well, people ask me what I'm going to do because, like Myron says, some people resist it and some people go with it. Um, you know, it's all of a sudden, as you said, and I, I was sort of was smiling when you said it, because I do tell the story a lot. You know, years ago, I told my own kids, I said, well, it depends on how you would define fame. If you define it, that people around the world who've never met you know who you are. I'm famous because, you know, everybody uses high intensity lasers know who I am. And my, my kids are there going, if you want to think you're famous, mom, you just go right ahead. You know, <laughs> just know you're not. But just. Now, I know one of my daughter's friends is actually uh, registered for this. I don't know if she's listening, but when I sent the text to my daughter that I had won, her first instinct was, oh no, mom's phone's been hacked. Her girlfriend actually uh, contacted her and said, that's great news about your mom. And she actually sent back to her daughter, or to her friend, no, I think mom's phone's been hacked. <laughs> she goes, it's on the news. <laughs> your mom really won it, okay? So it does change the perception of everybody around you, you know, how smart you're supposed to be. To the point where obviously you can't be now as smart as people now. <laughs> as Myron says, you're supposed to be smart about so many things and you can really only be smart about <laughs> The little thing you're smart about, you know. Um, so I still should only talk about high intensity lasers. But again, as Myron says, you get invited to speak places, and some of the places you really want to go, or you really want to see the other talks. And so you think, what do I know about it? But if they're willing to have me come and you know take part in this, I'll pretend. So uh, that's that's really what it is. But I mean, it's just been incredible. One of the most amazing ones was Brian May of Queen, um, is also got his PhD in physics, right? A lot of people don't seem mm -hmm. to know that. Um, and, you know, he really works on having science outreach use his music. And he brings the Apollo astronauts. So not only did I get to see Brian May performing at a concert, they actually, while well, he's singing, we are the champions, they're bringing up the Apollo astronauts who have been on the moon, you know? So how could I say no to, to going to that, even though, you know? What did I, it, it, the whole thing is about going to the moon and what do I know about that? Nothing, <laughs> didn't care, I go. That, that sounds almost better than the, 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 than the prize. I, I remember being on the campus of Berkeley and noticing they have designated reserve parking spots for Nobel laureates, which not was a, uh, imp, imp, not part a, of me. I'll, always my Stanford colleagues uh, beat me up because they say Berkeley gives a parking spot, Stanford does not. <laughs> Waterloo did though. Somebody let our, our president know that Waterloo or that Berkeley does that. So I do have my own parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> Within your own field though, does it change? I mean, it, it, it's, it's uplifting and the, and the prize money must be nice, but does it, does it change or transform uh, in any way your, your, your research? Well, in, in my case, um, it allowed me to not to be less parsimonious. Maybe I was at the time uh, moving in that direction anyway, but it, it freed me up to say, okay, I don't have to keep proving that if I have, uh, you know, a, 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 a narrow uh, in-depth approach to a particular problem, I can now branch out and I can be broader in the way I think about things. And that's what really freed me up because all my work in all my life has been on uncertainty and how uncertainty affects decision making in my area. And that allowed me then to just start reading dramatically and 
myriad other areas and how they addressed uncertainty and how they talked about things. And as Len and I have talked about uh, for a long time, it got me away from the idea of, of thinking about center focus to thinking about how important in life in general under uncertainty, uh, the tails affect our lives, such as we know COVID-19 is a tail where we never thought about that. And in my area, mm. it, everyone concentrates on the middle of the distribution. And I was very interested in how tails affect uh, our actions and what we do. And it allowed me to really escape from the narrow focus to be broader and freed me up to really think in directions that were outside in the norm of how we tend to be addressing problems in my area. And, and Donna, within your 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 field, uh, did the uh, did, did the path of your research change dramatically? No, not so far. Uh, it probably it took me away from the lab. So some some in some ways it might have slowed it down a bit because I have traveled a lot actually until COVID. Uh, in February, I remember looking at my calendar thinking I'm only going to be home three days a month until August. Mm. And then the, at that meeting, the very next, you know, I came home from that meeting and everything got shut down. So I've been home ever since. But um, I had somehow let my schedule get completely uh, out of control. So in that way, it probably sl is slowing me down. So I'll have to turn that around. Um, I would say it's helped more on my public policy. I was um, working with mm. the Opera Society uh, talk, talking about how to explain the importance of photonics to governments around the world. And we decided that um, it should be about um, the environment to go along with the Paris Accord. Uh, and just how important it is that you don't know what the problem is unless you can measure it. And photonics is a great way to measure it. And I mean, I tried to get the government's ear uh, before in 2017 and, and wasn't so successful. And uh, then the second meeting that we were having was in November of 2018. So it was just a month after. And then I had, I started to get the ear of the um, government because again, they now think I'm like this smart person and I should be listening. No, it's a great point because uh, they, 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 the Nobel opens doors and people do sit up. Uh, and I think you know people like John Polanyi, Art McDonald would say the same. They were kind of drawn into larger policy conversations and, and tried to, uh, to, to elevate elevate those conversations. I wonder if we if we can switch a bit to that question of what this means for Canada and whether we should be striving for more Nobel laureates. Uh, do you feel we're, we're, we're punching at our weight, below our weight? Um, but if it's below our weight, what would we need to do to not necessarily just win more prizes for the sake of prizes, but to produce that caliber of research that uh, draws that sort of recognition. Donna, if I, if I can stay with you for that and then switch back to Myron. Uh, I don't know. I got asked this question when I was in Korea and for about Korea, you know, because Korea has since um, the last the Korean War, they have really tried to say, you know, what can we do for our country? And they really put their eggs in the science basket, right? They, they made a science city mm -hmm. and they just uh, did so much effort in trying to get academics, government, and industry all to work together. And the first time, it was 2011 when I was in Korea, and right after that, I was in Russia, I remember, and I saw these three um, billboards, one for Hyundai, one for LG, and one for Samsung. And I went, isn't that amazing that Korea has gone from being such a poor country to having sort of the big things in all of these areas that mm. you see around the world? So that when I got asked by the head of their National Academy, what can Korea do to finally get um, a Nobel Prize? I said, but isn't it more important <laughs> that you took your science and your research and you have made yourself a really wealth, you know, a wealthy country? I mean, and, and the climb has been amazing. Mm. And I think countries around the world should be looking at you and saying, we need to find out from you. But you could tell that they were still like, no, we've been putting a lot of effort at this and we want our Nobel Prize. So I think I think Canada for the size of country has done has done pretty well. I don't know, you know, we probably get less than one tenth of the United States, but the United States seems to get a little bit more than their say. And when we talk early on about, you know, the gender and everything in diversification, if you look, they are still very um, Euro and uh, America centric, the, the Nobel prizes. Japan seems to get in there, but outside of Japan, Asia does not get in there very much yet either. Um, 
And so it would be nice to see it all get yeah. diversified a bit more. Um, but I don't know, I think we get them. Yeah. I mean, because in a way it wasn't a Canadian, but he's working at the University of Alberta, the um, physiology medicine person. Yes. Yeah. So it's sort of, we're gonna take him, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's in Canada. So, you know, if we're getting them every, every couple of years, I think that's pretty good for our size country. And Myra, maybe to add to the question, what do we need to do differently to take greater advantage of uh, recognition awards like this? Um, that's always a tough question for me to answer because first of all, the Nobel Prize is not a prize you go seek, you know, it's awarded to you. Mm. For work. And when I did my work, I didn't ever think that it was going to be awarded the Nobel Prize. I didn't do the work to be awarded the Nobel Prize. I did it because I was curious about a problem and I, no one had solved the problem and no one had addressed the problem even. And I thought this is a very important problem and it needed to be worked on. And that's what I did instead of problem. And so my thinking is that what creates curiosity and in my area, I was thinking about it. We have three Nobel Prize winners in economics that were born in Canada and there's others to come, you know? So it's not as though we're talking about you, something you could do, it's just the idea of appreciating the value of curiosity and creativity and learning and how to get the best learning you can and not be based in a way of thinking about a problem that's so narrowly focused, you don't look to the right or to the left, you know? And if you wanna be in the herd all the time and you can be in the herd and you can be a, a, a make a great uh, ability to do things, but a lot of people who don't wanna be in the herd are the ones that are potentially either get slaughtered, they don't create anything, or they might be, get great work that creates a Nobel Prize, you know, in my case, I just went off into my own world and I said, this is a problem that had to be solved. So I could have been slaughtered. I could get nowhere and not got any results at all. But so it's the idea, how do you create curiosity? Was it, you know, I don't know how I was creating curiosity or why I did that or why I was interested, but it was partially the schooling, partially what I learned, partially what my, what I was trained to do somewhere along the line. And I did it. And so uh, basically I, I think that it's, it's uh, what we want to do is really think that there is a uh, an ability to uh, to uh, support those who want to be outliers in various ways, and that's science. You know, supporting scientists and not always wanting to could do exactly the same thing as others. And a lot of our system in in tenure, a lot of the system and what we do in academics is really narrowly focused on various aspects of science and doesn't allow people early on to deviate too much from the narrow road. And it's only if you deviate a lot from the narrow road and are successful that you essentially can create things that might be awarded a Nobel Prize later on. But that's not why you originally left the road. Mm. I, I, I got to turn to questions from the audience because a number of uh, have come in. They're, they're, they're terrific, so please keep uh, adding to them. Um, Donna, maybe I can uh, put this one to you first about uh, maintaining motivation after winning the prize. It's hard to uh, top a Nobel. Um, does that become a motivational challenge over time? Is there a post-Nobel uh, post uh, fatigue for, for, for researchers and scientists? Well, I think like Myron, I was never trying to win a Nobel Prize, so I, I don't think I can have fatigue. It wasn't like I was striving for it. And people do ask me who this guy is behind me, and this is Alexander Graham Bell behind me. Uh, the bust was made by my husband's grandfather. That's why we have this picture. Uh, but, you know, he, he the, the story about him being a disgruntled old man because he never topped the telephone, right? And I, I've never, my very first paper was CPA, and so I've never thought through the whole life, oh, I have to top CPA, I've never tried. <laughs> I, I knew it was big and, and, and that was fine. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that that's a problem. I think uh, I still have uh, the spark to, to start. And I'm, I'm working on something that nobody else is caring about. And again, I guess as Myron says, I don't have to worry about that at all, except I still have to try to get students and students probably. <laughs> uh, I think we are judged too much by you know, our citation counts and all these things that mm. require you to stay in the mainstream, which as Myron says, we have to somehow find a way to uh, entice people to sort of take the un unpaved road a bit, right? But 
So let me let, let me stay with that thought because that plays to uh, and I'll come back to you with this, Myron, as, as well to the question, Myron. I think you raised this earlier about the uh, the long uh, uh, gestation period for research to be recognized for a Nobel, which seems uh, almost out of step with society today, where just everything is faster and faster. Immediate gratification seems to be uh, seems to be our way now. Um, is there? Uh, is there a pressure in research, Donna, to 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 do things faster and faster? Uh, and, and what are we losing uh, as a as a result of that? And I guess by extension, uh, what should we recognize in terms of this long gestation period that the Nobel uh, applies that maybe we should uh, apply to other parts of uh, of academia? Well, I think this is one of the things that I think uh, North America falls into this more than the rest of the world especially that they, when they want academics to work with industry, it's industry wants us to do something on a six month time frame, and that's in no way, shape or form an academic time frame where we are to be training students along the way and, and what have you. So whereas I do think other places in the world have figured out how to get people to work together, but on long range plans, on, on just thinking about something that could maybe be a product 10 years down the road. Now I'll give a shout out to my fellow Waterloo person. I mean, Mike Lazaridis has changed the physics landscape here in Waterloo because he said, mm. I want to do a perimeter institute. This is for research that, you know, is not going to turn necessarily into a product anytime soon. It's just how to do research that's uh, well out of the box. So it's great that he was willing to do that. Um, I don't know that we can count on that many people to stand up and, and put that money down. But if you think about the beginning of the United States, I think a lot of the people that made a lot of money um, did think that education was the, the way forward to get the young country to really grow. And so I think we have to keep that in our head is that it does take a long time. And that, you know, like my Korea case, you know, it took 40 years of them climbing up to get it to go. And they didn't lose sight of that. And I think um, the, the short term thing has some consequences. But Myron, the economist, can probably tell you that better than I can. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Myron, how do we both uh, meet these short term expectations and maintain? a focus on the long run? That the long run is made up of a sequence of short runs. Mm. Well said. You can't say, what do you, how can you ignore the short run if you're gonna to get to the long run? But the question is that every path you take has uh, steps you have to take to go to the long run. And some of the research that's done is fundamental research, which has no real immediate payoff in that short run and some of it has intermediate run payoff and some has short run payoff as people try to adapt what is done before. And one of the great things about science that I've enjoyed is listening to people who in my area who are doing theoretical and has no immediate application to anything. And but it keep, it, when I hear it and listen to it, it stimulates my mind. It gives me a a way to think, hey, that's a different way to look at something. I don't really understand where it's going or what's going to happen, but it triggers things and it helps for creativity. So in any university or any community, we have to have a mixture of those who are doing theory, those who are doing applied, uh, because it's the combination of both that count. In our field, or our lives, it's induction. It's really the most important thing. It's very hard to deduce anything without having any data or any preconception of what's going to happen. So you have to look at what the short run is providing, and that it helps your intuition. That it creates induction, and from the induction, we can deduct. We can deduce what to do from that, and hopefully, we haven't data mined too much, and we can rely on theory. And the theory helps us uh, move forward. So I think it's a combination of all those things, and I, and. Uh, and that's very important in science, you know, because it's uh, it's it's create it creates a whole growth in our way of thinking about problems and a way of of creating things that are very valuable for society. And it's also There's, a, uh, you have to keep my especially like in my own research field is that you know I developed a new laser, which is a new technique that we used, and so that's a very almost engineering thing that we did, and it turned around and changed the fundamental science that we understood. And then from that came came the surgery that people eventually figured out from that. And it just you know, it keeps going. You know, you need it all. It's a circle. So well, there's another question here about populism, which I think speaks to this tension between uh, both uh, concrete, and, concrete and abstract, but short term and long term. Uh, in an increasingly populist age, what weight do the Nobel Prizes carry 
in public opinion. And I think we may add to that some thoughts about the challenges that science is facing in uh, the, the with with parts of the public today. And if there's anything the Nobel conversations can help do or how, how can they change to overcome, I don't know if it's a rising tide, that may be a bit of hyperbole, but certainly some challenges, populist challenges to to notions of science. Donna, maybe we can start with uh, start with you for that. Well, I have to say, I think this is one of the good things that have come out of COVID. Um, we were almost certainly in the West stopping considering that scientists were helping society much at all, right? I think when I was a child, it was one of the ones that, you know, which, who could you count on? You could count on scientists, and that seems to uh, erode it here. Um, and so people are sort of thinking they have to listen to scientists more than they were. I think, though, in North America, we, we still have to uh, fight that a little bit. Uh, again, if you go to Asia, they're almost rock stars. I mean, it's, it's really quite a different uh, take on the whole thing. I've seen statues in a Chinese park that was to a Chinese scientist. And I asked the person, I said, well, what do these just general people in this park think when they see this? They went, they all know who he is. I went, of course they do. You know, I, I think outside of Einstein, I don't think North America could have a statue of a scientist and any of us would recognize who the person is, right? Um, so we don't have that kind of appreciation. Uh, but I think one of the other things that I do hope I can use my Nobel voice for is science literacy. You know, I think we do have to somehow bring it back and say that we do have to take data and we have to understand that the data evolves, but we have to make the best of it always. Yeah. And wait, what's the one thing you would do to uh, improve science literacy? Well, some of the things that I've been trying to think about is the fact that, of course, we need scientists that can communicate better. Uh, we need that. But I think I also would like to talk to sociologists and psychologists because, uh, you know, when I give a public talk, uh, I try to be a good communicator, but I also know that my whole audience are science lovers. Nobody came to hear me give, you know, my Nobel lecture that didn't already appreciate science, right? And so I think we're going to have to start uh, thinking about the sociology and psychology of what does it take to get the non-believer or the person who just doesn't care, whichever, um, that would want to start learning a little bit more about science, you know? So, and I've, I, I've said it on another interview where, you know, we make sure um, literacy became such a thing that you, you did not want to admit that you can't read. You certainly didn't want your kids not reading. We were all told to get reading to your kids at bed, make sure they're all, you know, you know, but do we all get told as young parents, make sure you're doing a little science experiment with your kids or, taking them to the science museum or doing something. I think we do have to get the culture around that it's not just enough to know how to read. Myron, how, how, how should we be thinking about the populist challenges to science well, or to yeah, expertise yeah. more broadly? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, populism is getting uh, many definitions and many words that uh, we're talking about a, a populist in the sense of uh, governance or redistribution of uh, wealth. We're talking about populism and bringing everyone up to a uh, be equality. But I really think that we have to think in a democracy about the idea of equal opportunity and, and then allow people to have equal opportunity. It's not equality per se. And if we think about redistribution and growth, and the growth in science is the growth in creating things. The growth in our society is doing similarly. And if we just concentrate on redistribution alone, we'll lose the growth component. And we can end up with a redistribution of the pie that we create and everything we do, but the pie can get very small <laughs> over time. So we have to keep marrying together the idea of how we balance those two. And if we go back to the classical economists that I learned in my when I started off at McMaster and, and later on in my career, you know, even if you go back to Adam Smith, he wasn't saying it wasn't just growth, he was saying any democracy and any system to survive, Trocabell said the same thing, is the idea idea of thinking about how we create a system of, uh, of uh, equal opportunity and how we bring those who are disadvantaged up 
and not have that be that the distribution of income is so wide that we have no mm. ability to grow. And so basically in science, if we're gonna think that way, we wanna encourage anyone who can be into science, give them equal opportunity. And I really believe that instead of uh, talking in the way we are in the populist mantra is seeing what this COVID, for example, do, uh, that enables us to do distance learning and do it in a much more efficient way is the university system that we built in the United States and Canada, where you have so few of students actually being at elite universities. Do we need to change that and allow for more science in general to be propagated through having more information and more ability to learn in different ways? And, you know, what's, and I think really the science that's going to change everything is, you know, the 5G technology that is sitting in the wings and will be put into force as soon in, in combination with supercomputers and maybe advanced uh, AI, which is going to help dramatically. So all of that science is going to lead to a whole new world for all of us, and it's going to be appreciated, that new world, and it's going to add tremendously to the need, demands for scientists who can really use the new technologies and the growth that we're going to provide. Myron, if I can stay with you for another minute, uh, I've got a question here on economics uh, for you. What is the best measure of a country's development? Is, is, is it GDP or is GDP relevant anymore? Um, all right, that's a technical question. Um, <laughs> actually, GDP is a bad number. GDP is just the idea of it's a dividend to our society. But even when we think about increasing the GDP of our country, the gross domestic product of our country, we can do that, but it might be actually depreciating our wealth. So it's one thing to say we want to increase the growth of our uh, GDP, our GDP as a metric. But really, we have to think about good GDP and bad GDP. I can borrow money and invest in things, and the government can do it, that add nothing to our society or very little to our society. And basically, we have huge debts, which have to be paid off somehow. And so I think that the idea of concentrating on GDP as opposed to wealth and how we define wealth and what is the wealth of our community and society is a mistake. We have to think about wealth creation and what the effects of what we're doing on our society through uh, the programs we institute are uh, very, very important. Donna, a, a question for you on uh, the, the challenges for female scientists. What were or are the additional challenges you've encountered as a female scientist? And perhaps in addition, what, what can be done to reduce those challenges or barriers? So I, I, I've had some trouble uh, being sort of this uh, flag bearer for, for women in science because I really didn't. I would, like to know, I would like to know about male scientists too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, really I don't know that I've had know. any more challenges than they have, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's that I ignore them or I'm just luckier than most women. I don't know. Um, the only one that's come up, and it comes up more for women than men, just because there's so few in, certainly in my day, there were so few women, almost all women scientists were married to male scientists. That can't, that's not true for male scientists because we were only 10% women. So, you know, so out of the at least heterosexual part of us, you know, 90% just couldn't find their spouse that way. So then it, that brings up the two body problem. And I would say that's one of the biggest issues is that for women, because most of us are married to scientists and there's very few jobs for scientists that once you have two scientists looking for jobs and you know, you're know you lucky to find a job for a scientist in a city, you know, to find two, is, is, it gets hard. So um, this is why my husband and I, in our first year of marriage, lived right across the country from each other. Um, mm. And then eventually got together. So, so it's a bigger problem for women, but when we become 50-50, it'll be a big problem for both of us. Actually in, uh, in economics, the Shapley, uh, methodology try to solve the, the two the two person problem by in residency and medical residency and did a terrific job doing that. So uh, by uh, figuring out how to get people in the right groups together. So maybe in the future with men, which is now getting to be a bigger problem, with many more women and men in their profession. So um, That's right. there's new technologies then and, and game theory which help uh, solve that problem. But I think in your also day, no one's just thinking about it. 
I, th I think more people hiring understand that they have to think about the two body problem and how they can, you know, yeah. make two, two jobs. Yes. It, does, does COVID allow for more uh, telecommuting in science? Are we losing the sense of geography in place or is this just temporary, Donna? Well, of course, there's always a discussion between the theorists and the experimentalists, right? I mean, the theor you know, my daughter's in astrophysics, and so they're taking the data from a computer anyway, so they don't really have to be in the lab. I mean, my group builds lasers, so <laughs> it's been a whole lot harder uh, on us than uh, it is on other people. I think there always has to be experimental work done, and so that can't be done afar. That, has, that really is people putting their hands on something and building something. I suppose eventually, if it all ends up being done by robots, then we can all, uh, you know, run our robots from home. But we're not there yet. One of, one of the interesting areas that I worry about, and I don't know what Donna feels about this, but the next generation. You know, we have so many young students and uh, that are undergraduates or graduates, and they don't have the same ability to connect, and uh, they're, it's very tough to have them being able to drop in and ask questions. It's very tough to figure out how to get them excited and figure out how to get them on the right path, you know, when you're sitting in a computer uh, at home. And uh, you, 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 Do you mean because of the pandemic, they don't have the ability to, to interact tough. in person? It's tougher, very, it's tougher. And, uh, and uh, you know, maybe we'll solve that problem soon, but right now I worry about that. Interesting question here for you both on the idea of disappointment and what you would say to those who keep finding disappointment or encountering disappointment and failure in their work uh, that they're deeply passionate about. And maybe that's a bit of an overstatement failure, but maybe just not finding adequate re recognition, how to keep going uh, in uh, when you're in the wilderness. <laughs> well, first of all, you got to... <laughs> You know, it's a tough problem because, you know, is there an answer? Is it there? You know, maybe I have to tell you, maybe if you if you can't solve it. I mean, I tried to solve the question of the NP complete problem for 20 years just as a hobby. You know, every once in a while I go back to it and try to say, is, is there is is that a problem that has a solution? And I just decided there was no solution, or at least I couldn't solve it after a while. So the interesting issue is that there's problems that I work on, and I work on a variety of problems. And I don't concentrate necessarily just on one problem, but some things are always nagging on my brain, and therefore I come back to it from time to time. And sometimes when I'm listening to a lecture by someone in a disparate area, it triggers some idea in my head, and I, oh yeah, I got to go back to what I was thinking about on that other problem. And I start working there, but some problems I'm not going to solve, but you know, that, that's fine. I, I, um, I am not adverse to trying them, but the question is, I have to know when to stop too, you know, when to hold them and when to fold them, you know, it's a very tough, tough issue as a scientist. Yeah, Donna, how have you uh, managed those, those, those challenges, both pre and post Nobel? Well, I mean, I, I, the, the question sort of surprised me because, um, I don't know that I've ever gone through life thinking, oh, I just need to be rewarded for this. Obviously, I knew I needed tenure or you're out of a job. And so that's a, a scary proposition. Um, but also a lot of people made uh, a lot of the fact that this is my, uh, I won the Nobel for my very first paper. But I was already in my fourth year of grad school. I had tried many things that did not work, right? And I watched all of my fellow grad students in the group going off to the conferences and presenting their work. And I was still there going, I got to get something that actually, you know, moves forward and doesn't just go off the rails. So, um, you know, and luckily I had the whole group around me, you know, not making me feel bad about it and just trying to encourage me to keep moving forward that these things happen in science. I mean, the point is, is that uh, at least with, I think with Gerard's group, he was always trying off the wall things. So they don't all work, right? <laughs> um, but also, I, yeah, I think when I get frustrated, I just go for a walk. I mean, you have to somehow not just beat yourself up constantly you have to finally just take a breather and say life's okay um but i also am always a little surprised when people ask me about how to get these awards because i think mm. uh you have to just take real pride in knowing that you've accomplished something i don't think that one wants to wait for somebody else to tell you that you've done something good i think the the happiness comes from when you know you've done something good and the work itself is its own award great advice on going for a walk too 
Yeah, I think, well, that's just it. I mean, 99% of the time, it's just not working in the lab. But then the 1% of the time that it's working, it's just such a fun, blah, you know? and so it's so great. So you have to keep telling yourself that 1% of the time is coming. You just have to work through the 99%. The, the eureka moment. Uh, a question here about brain drain, and I'll, I'll, I'll use it to flag as Len said, I've got a new book out this week called Planet Canada. And it's about our global population, the two or three million Canadians living, working, studying outside our country, which my, my, my core thesis and argument is they are a strategic asset for Canada. They're like an 11th province who we need to mobilize and mobilize for Canada's benefit, but also in recognition that we live in an age of networks uh, and networks are more powerful than institutions in, uh, in many ways in the world today. And we have great networks of Canadians all over the world. You know this in your, your, your fields and we don't network with them and activate them enough uh, for the greater benefit of Canada and Canadians. Uh, I devoted a chapter to the debate about brain drain because it's uh, something every Canadian tends to have an opinion about and I uh, get to profile uh, a bit of McMaster and Burt Brockhaus who uh, was, was a, a terrific uh, academic and, and human, uh, but spoke to a number of Canadians uh, in the US who uh, talked about this is long ago in the 70s and even 60s, would come on recruiting trips to, uh, to Canada. They found McMaster a great hiring ground because it, it, it produced wonderful mathematicians, great physicists who they could take off to, to uh, MIT or Caltech or such have you. And Canadians were always appalled by that. And uh, I'm not sure we see the advantage of having Canadians well-placed around the world in some of these uh, universities and that bringing, bringing them back, bringing others back as well of different nationalities. Uh, so I just say that as a, a, a reference from, uh, from this book, but wonder if you, uh, how you both reflect on brain drain uh, as you counter it in your, your fields. Is it, uh, is it a problem for Canada or do we need to see it as, uh, I, I call it brain, brain circulation, others call it brain gain, but uh, there's probably other, other, other tags for it as well. I can Donald, start. Go, I, Mark, I, go ahead. I, I've always said to my students and to um, others who uh, that basically you have to go where the best are. You go where the mm. best are. You steal as much as you can from your fellow best that you're with. Okay, but you got to be careful when you when I tell you to go where the best are and learn as much as you can with them and from them because you have to be the best yourself. If you're not the best yourself, you'll be kicked out, okay? They don't want you. So basically, the one of the great things about science is you go where the best are, and you learn with the best, and you create with the best. And as a result of that, everyone in their life, whether they're Canadians or Americans or Europeans, should try to find where the best group is for them, that they can then grow and learn and create. And if you're not in the best group for you, find it. You know, and so I've been a more of an internationalist, not necessarily just a, a centralist in terms of whether it's Canada or the United States. And a lot of teams work and are very efficient in different areas in Canada or in the United States or whatever. And I've always found that um, that's a good model to have. I might be wrong, but that's a model I think is what everyone should have is trying to find where the best is for them so they can learn the most. The more you learn, the more you can grow, the better you're off, the better they're off. The way I look yeah, at it. Yeah, and then the, 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 the obligation is, is on us as a country to connect with you wherever you are, regardless of geography, and make sure you remain Canadian and contributing to Canada if you're at Princeton or uh, in, in, in China or wherever it might uh, be, you're no less Canadian and the opportunity for you to contribute to Canada is uh, arguably no less Donna, how do you think about the brain drain question? Well, I mean, I think science to some extent is international. I mean, it's funny that it's it's not when it comes to funding and stuff. Um, mm. I had trouble coming back to Canada and getting the job when I was at grad school in Rochester. And then once I was a postdoc in Canada, I had trouble getting back into the States. I think there's, there's something about the funding that helps you get to be better known inside your own country. Um, I agree that I think uh, as scientists, we, ha we have to go sometimes we just have to go where we can get a job, but sometimes we go where we think we can get the best information 
surroundings, what have you. I think it's the onus is on Canada to make it so it's that we want to attract people from around the world too, right? I think sometimes we almost act like an inferiority complex that somehow we're losing our people. And the question really is, why aren't we attracting the people? Uh, and sometimes when we go after it and we do things, we can do it. And so I don't think we have to worry about it. I think we actually, you know, bring in incredibly bright people to Canada too and, and make the most of those uh, immigrants. So uh, it, it goes all ways. I think we have to be open to everybody moving around. And like you said, we can certainly be networked uh, and, and knowing each other, but uh, I don't think we should be afraid of it. I think we should embrace it and make the most of it. Yeah, especially uh, if you are know, different from uh, uh, President Trump in the United States and his view on how immigration should be curtailed in the United States, in the academic spheres, and and that every everyone who's not an American or you're not U.S. born or U.S. citizen is a threat. That's completely crazy, in my mm. That's not time for a couple more. Yeah, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, one is on uh, the, the role of McMaster. What uh, we'll probably talk at length about this, so I'll just ask you to maybe focus on one thing that you drew from McMaster that you still value that uh, added significantly to uh, to your career. Uh, that's been a long time. I'm an old guy, you know, I can hardly stand up now. You're asking me to remember back to 1962, okay? So it's a long time. And, you know, McMaster was a very small school when I came there. And one of the interesting things, I was interested in uncertainty and all the professors were really had models were certain models, certainty models, you know, and, and they sort of explained different things in the fundamentals of the of economics. But it led me to say, I'm frustrated. You know, I want to go off and try to learn about where I can learn more about uncertainty and really think of that in that dimension. And uh, mm. really set the stage uh, for me. I for me it was the, it was great because. My mother passed away when I was 16 years old and I lived in Hamill and my father said, stay here for university and McMaster was a real home for me. And, uh, and uh, when I graduated, I went off to the United States for graduate school. But for me, I learned and I could take as much as I could from there. I spent a lot of time in the library, you know, trying to mm -hmm. read books that uh, essentially uh, trying to solve the mystery of life. And, you know, I still am trying to solve the mystery of life. Maybe a couple of years from now, I'll be able to get there. Donna, what uh, what did you value most about uh, Mac? Mm, there's a few things. Um, I mean, I did go to McMaster because I, you know, I saw that they had an engineering physics program, and that just seemed so right for me. Uh, I did see that they had a lasers program, and that just sounded. I didn't knew nothing about lasers, you know. Um, I just thought they sounded so cool. And why wouldn't I want to study that? And so to me, they were right on the edge. This is the 70s and lasers were not seen everywhere like they are now. Um, and I got to study uh, on that group. But I would also say that I probably, you know, I was that nerdy little uh, shy high school kid and I went off and lived at Moulton Hall. And it, that was probably a bigger learning experience. And I remember talking to the um, Dean of Women's Studies or something, I forget what she was. But she really wanted to have a scholarship floor in um, whatever. There was a big woman's uh, residence. I can't think of the name. Uh, and I fought against that. I said, no. I said, I think it's more important for somebody like me to be with people that aren't necessarily the top, top students because I need a little bit of social skills more than I need uh, any more help studying. Uh, I think scholarship students can uh, figure out how to get to a library and study. What we need is a kick in the pants to uh, maybe go to a party. So I, I loved, uh, I met some great girlfriends at Moulton Hall and I like that too. That's a great, uh, great uh, in, insight, a timeless one as well. I wanted to save this question uh, for the end or uh, as, as a pen, penultimate advice for uh, future Nobel winners who are in the audience tonight. Um, what's your advice to, to them? How should they be thinking about, uh, and this is more generally to, to young academics, young researchers, how should they be thinking about their future and taking on the world in the 2020s? Well, they shouldn't be hoping for a Nobel Prize. Like, you know, there's a very good chance they're going to be frustrated in life. Um, I mean, I, I mean, maybe that seems mad, you know, bad of me to say since I've got the Nobel Prize and they don't yet, but um, I certainly didn't think about winning it. You know, uh, mm. again, I think Maya already said it. I think you have to find what you really want to do. 
if you're doing what you really love doing, you're just going to do it the best you can. And, and that's the best for you and it's best for society as a whole. So I think you have to try to figure out who you are and, and what really makes you tick and just go for it. Yeah. Myron, what's your, your, your advice to young researchers starting out? Well, you have to understand uh, what your makeup is and your composition is and what you think your skills are. I mean, some people are very good uh, hunters and some people are good farmers, you know. We need both in society. We need uh, those people who can actually uh, be the uh, appliers and uh, do things and you're not necessarily going to be awarded a Nobel Prize. Uh, you have to have a temperament to be willing to take risks in the hunting sphere and uh, a lot of people are not going to tell you where the meat is or where the fish are <laughs> you're going to have to figure out how to hunt yourself and figure out ways in which you can uh, do it so it's going to be um, uh, I don't necessarily say one as we said at the start should really think I'm going to start doing science to win the Nobel Prize. I don't think that that's the way you want to do it. You have to turn it the other on its head and really think about what is there a problem and what is it I think that this is, needs to be solved and I want to try to solve it and go off and do it. And that means you could fail dramatically, okay? And not only do you not win the Nobel Prize, if you're awarded the Nobel Prize, you're not, you don't win it. It's, just, it's not mm. like, you're, like drawing from a hat, you know? So uh, basically, I personally think that for everyone, you got to know what you love to do. You got to think about what your skills are, what you want to dig into, how you, how you're, you have to be uh, persistent. You have to be resilient and you have to be adaptable. You know, you can't, if you're, if you if you're not in that dimension and it's in those dimensions, it's going to be very hard. So I, not everyone has to uh, be awarded the Nobel prize. And there's so many people who are respected, who do things that would nowhere be close to, uh, being awarded the Nobel Prize, and there's those who are awarded the Nobel Prize for their work, and there's a lot of people who should have been awarded the Nobel Prize and who weren't, and vice versa. There's probably those who are awarded the Nobel Prize and shouldn't have been, you know. So it's it's just uh, it's um, that's what life is. Persistent, resilient, and adaptable. Those are great uh, words of advice for people of any any age. We've got just a minute left. What uh, if I could just ask in conclusion about the un, what in your mind or in your heart are the great, what, what's the great unanswered question or unsolved mystery of your field that you would love to see solved or answered in your, uh, in your lifetime? Myron, if we could uh, start with you. Oh, well, you know, there, there's so many different problems that need to be solved. You know, I think that uh, basically the, in, the areas that I am really trying to focus on and have, it still is, have, there's so many problems to solve, is really how do we, um, you know, in economics, really address uncertainty in a more persistent and consistent manner. And, uh, you know, to me, the, the fascination of changes in the field will be brought about by all the new ways in which we will be able to understand the infrastructure of finance. I know, for example, you are with RBC at the current time, and, and a lot of the history of the whole area of economics has been based on uh, what the technology has existed since the start of time. And uh, the new technologies that are being developed now are going to change dramatically our entire lives. And two is you know, what, how the demographics are going to change and how scarcity is going to change. So all these things are just going to lead to myriad problems that need to be solved. And then the governance structure of how politics and, and is going to interrelate with demographics, how it's going to relate with technology, how it's going to relate with scarcity. And the interaction of all of these just leave the field in a dynamic, fluid uh, state at the current time. So fundamental principles, yes, are the, are the corner of it, but they could be, they could evolve and change as well. And, you know, and that they're just very small number of truths, but you have to use those to think about how all these mm -hmm. other things are going to change uh, the area. And Donna, what uh, was the greatest mystery you'd love to see solved? 
don't know that I, ha- I I don't know that I have these you know one things. I, I watch you know people like my astro colleagues who have to build big telescopes, so they have to come together and to ask these questions. Whereas we laser people can just try something out for a few weeks in our lab and uh, see if it works or not. Um, when I, I give the talk about the uh, laser that we developed, uh, both my supervisor probably more than him, him than me, but. We talk about how we're trying to get to this. Um, we still have eight more as a magnitude to go. So we've gone 12, we have eight more to go. Uh, and when we get there, as soon as you focus the light, out should come matter from nothing. You should be able to focus it into the vacuum and out will come electrons and positrons because that's what the vacuum is made out of. People say, what's the science in that? I don't know, because we already know that that's what the vacuum is made out of. I just think it'll be really cool to see light go in and matter come out. I just, I, I doubt I get to see it in my lifetime. Um, even though we've gone 12 orders uh, already, it, those last eight are going to be a tough eight to get to, but uh, people are trying. I just think it'll be fun. That's to great. See. That's great. Well, I think we're, uh, we're at the top of the hour. This has been such an extraordinary conversation. I just want to thank you personally. I think someone is also uh, going to join us to uh, to wrap up but uh, thank you for your contributions and uh, a really stimulating stimulating uh, evening thank you thank you